our speaker for the night. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, very funny jokes once again, you guys, and great job on the quiz, Mark. And um, congratulations to all the Los Angeles Birder students who got it right. They knew Morning Dove. So welcome everyone uh, to part two of Los Angeles Birders webinar on sound recording with our speaker, Lance Benner. And as Ron mentioned, if you missed part one, don't worry, it's archived on our website at labirders.org. And though many of us are even more homebound now due to the fires and the smoke, in addition to the pandemic, I hope some of you were able to get outdoors and try some of Lance's recording suggestions and tips. As many of you already know, Lance has made significant contributions to audio data databases, including Xenocanto and the Macaulay Lab Library through eBird, and you can easily check those out on your own time, and they're, they're well worth your um, uh, looking at. Some of you have already probably listened to the, his recordings for your own personal use, but his recordings have also been used in research papers, books, educational nature programs, smartphone apps, and for the development of sound recognition software. So we're very pleased to have Lance with us again tonight as part two of our two-part webinar workshop. So uh, we'd like to extend a hearty welcome to Lance. Thank you, Lance. All right, well, thank you very much, Susan, uh, for the very kind words. Um, and thank you everybody for, uh, for tuning in uh, for part two of the, uh, the webinar. And so um, without any further ado, uh, let's get going. So you should now see in front of you a PowerPoint presentation. And <clears throat> now it should also show you uh, what the, uh, the agenda is for uh, tonight's uh, presentation. So last week we went through some introduction to some uh, some of the basics we talked about what sonograms are, uh, which we briefly reviewed. Uh, excuse me for a moment. I have to let the cat in. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, we talked about what a sonogram is, and uh, which we just reviewed a moment ago with uh, the sound quiz. Uh, we went through some examples of the Raven Light software, uh, the Audacity software. Uh, we talked about using uh, apps on cell phones to record bird sounds. Uh, oh, here comes the kitty. And um, tonight we're going to talk about some, uh, some more, uh, somewhat more complicated um, and advanced things. Not super advanced, but just a little more technical than last week. Um, including uh, dedicated sound recorders, um, some relatively entry-level ones, um, more complicated versions, and then a couple of advanced ones. Um, going to uh, <clears throat> talk a fair bit about external microphones, a um, um, couple types of shotgun microphones, and then also uh, parabolic dishes, um, connecting microphones to a cell phone, and um, then we're going to wrap it up by talking about uh, automatic recording units, also known as sound loggers. Um, before we do all of that, though, um, and if I don't get too distracted by uh, Mr. Big here, it's the cat that's in front of me, um, we're going to listen to some recordings. Uh, excuse me. And so let's try this one. So this is going to be a local species that I hope that, oh, excuse me, i got to move him, that I hope all of you have heard. It's a common species in our local canyons and in Chaparral. This is a Rufus Crown Sparrow recorded in Rubio Canyon in, um, in Altadena. So a very, very common bird in chaparral habitats. There were some other things in here too. Um, Buick wrens, for example, is a California quail. Um, it's a very high pitched call. I'm not completely sure what that was. It might have been a California towhee. Um, so let's uh, let's try another one. Um, let's see. This is going to be something that you're not very likely to hear in the Los Angeles area, um, assuming that I can find it. Ah, here we go. I have a number of screens open. So again, I'm using the Audacity software. We, uh, we had an introduction to that last week. 
Um, and <clears throat> so I'm just, just playing the recordings. As Mark said, the, the horizontal axis here is time. The vertical axis is frequency, or you can think of it as pitch. Um, the recorder that I used to get this particular recording um, and the last one actually records in stereo. Um, however, the way that I used it, it, it basically put the same sound into each of the two channels. So this recording, as I just showed, by doing that, has two different channels, but they're playing the same thing. So we're just going to concentrate on one of them. So we'll just move the other one down, and then, then we're going to listen to it. So this, this is a trumpeter swan. Um, recorded in central British Columbia um, in late March of last year. So there were actually two trumpeter swans. Uh, they were flying away from us. They're quite loud. Uh, this was recorded at a range of maybe four or 500 meters uh, at quite a distance. Um, and it was using um, a parabolic dish. Oh, excuse me, no, it was using a uh, shotgun microphone, which we'll take a look at in a short, a few, short time now. Um, there were a couple other things on there. There was a squirrel. There was an American crow, uh, a little bit of handling noise as well. All right, let's uh, do another one that'll be, again, something completely different from what we just were listening to. I just wanted to sort of go through a few interesting sounds. Um, in the previous uh, program, a week ago, oops, hit the wrong button. Hold on, we'll get that back up here. Um, I talked about um, a number of things, but one of them was um, compression artifacts. So this recording you see in front of you is a hermit thrush. Um, when you record with some of the, <coughs> excuse me, some of the cell phone apps, you do get compression artifacts, such as these big white areas here where information is just gone. Um, this, however, is not a recording obtained with a phone. Um, it was obtained with a, uh, with a Sony uh, recorder, uh, the one that I use most of the time, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I converted the file from a WAV file, in, which was the original format, to an MP3 in order to upload this to Xenocanto because Xenocanto accepts only MP3s. And that uh, process introduced compression artifacts, which are these white spots. So this is going to be a hermit thrush recorded at the Orono Bog near Bangor, Maine um, in July. Um, in addition to the thrush, there is also a white-throated sparrow that you'll hear. Uh, there's a cedar waxwing. Um, might be a couple of other things as well. So let's have a listen to this. Um, part of why I'm doing this is not only so you can hear it, but also it turns out that it's very difficult for the human ear to hear any of these compression artifacts. When I listen to this compared to the original recording, I, I really can't tell the difference. There's the sparrow. So this is also a good example of a bird that uses both sides of its syrinx to produce sounds um, simultaneously. Um, uh, thrushes are, of course, known for that. Um, this area right in here might be a good example of that. We, we can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you can see how this, 
this part here and this part here partially overlap in time. So that, that's an, in, and the fact that this isn't just something that's a harmonic or a multiple of one of the other frequencies is telling you that this is an instance where the bird is using both, both of its voice boxes at the same time. And here's another example here. So in this one, it made this sound, it used one voice box and that one, and that one it used the other. Again, it's something that, uh, that, that hermit thrushes are well known for doing. <clears throat> okay, so we heard the hermit thrush. Let me uh, get close some of these screens down so they aren't quite as distracting. And we heard the Rufus Crown Sparrow. And okay, we have another recording um, that we are going to save for later. So let me go back to PowerPoint and then we'll continue with that. Okay, so um, the recorders that I use um, span a range of introductory sort of beginner models uh, like an Olympus LS10 to a somewhat more intermediate uh, model such as, uh, such as this particular Sony uh, which is a PCMM10 and then to more advanced ones such as the sound devices Mix Pre 3. Um, let's see we already talked about the uh, iPhones and the, some of the apps that you can use for those. Um, in addition the other two of the other devices <coughs> excuse me that I sometimes use are um, programmable sound loggers I use an audio moth and a song meter mini and uh, we'll say a little bit about those at the end of the talk um, most of what we're going to do here though is, is discuss the the Olympus the Sony sound devices and a couple of others they're, they're devices that are commonly used by a lot of people who record birds so here is what two of them look like uh, the Olympus LS10 is on the left Sony is on the right. Um, they're both uh, small recorders. They're smaller than a cell phone. You can easily put them in your pocket, fit, fit in the palm of your hand. Um, both have been discontinued, but there are more updated models that are currently available. Um, the Olympus models are a really good place to start. They aren't that expensive. You can get a decent one for a couple hundred dollars or maybe less, particularly if you get, a, get one on eBay. Um, they use two AA batteries. Um, the Olympus, unfortunately, does not have a pre-record buffer, and to remind you, that's um, a, a feature that starts recording when you when you put the device into standby mode. It keeps a basically a, a several second buffer of what it what you've been hearing, and then when you actually hit record, then it records everything from several seconds back forward in time. So the Sony model over here on the right does have one of those buffers, which is really really helpful feature, which I use a lot. Um, as I say, although both of these have been discontinued, there are similar um, and, of course, more expensive models that are now available from both uh, Olympus and Sony. Um, the Tascam dr 5 is another really uh, widely used um, recorder. Um, I know Desi has one of these, and uh, I think he's done very well with it. It's a very capable recorder in the realm of $100. It has a pre-record buffer. I think it's three seconds. Um, at least it was at the time that I checked. I mean, maybe the modern versions are a little bit, uh, a little bit different. Um, it's not especially complicated. It, it can record WAV files, as can the other two that I mentioned, um, which is good because those are uncompressed. Uh, if you're looking for some place to start with a recorder that'll be better than your cell phone and more capable and more sensitive. Um, this is a good place, good place to start. And you know, if you decide it's not really something you're serious about, then you haven't put a lot of money into it. Um, I would not start with one of the big expensive ones unless you already are serious. Here is one of the bigger expensive ones. Um, the Marantz makes a lot of really nice electronic recording equipment, um, other, other electronics as well. Um, this particular model is one that's very commonly used, very widespread now among a lot of people who record birds. Uh, it's about $350. It's, it's a lot more complicated than the ones I just discussed. Um, it's very capable, which is also good. It's heavier. You need a different kind of case to hold it. You can't just slip it in your pocket as easily. You could, but it's bulky. Um, and there are a lot of options. And there's a, there's a learning curve to learn how to use a recorder like this. Um, I would recommend that if you're just starting out, to start with something that's less complicated than this, less expensive and less complicated. Um, ease your way into it because some of these devices have a lot of features and they can they can appear kind of overwhelming or bewildering at first glance 
and it can take a lot of patience if you're not already familiar with, with some of what these things can do to sort of sift through and understand what the capabilities are and how to configure it. So I would recommend starting with something simple and then working your way up in complexity and, and sophistication. Um, this is uh, another one of the recorders that I use. I, I don't use that Marantz recorder, but I do use this one. Um, Sound Devices makes some just spectacular audio equipment. Uh, this is used a lot by people who make movies and who, you know, do sound for weddings and other functions. But it's also very capable for recording things in the field. Um, it's called the Mix Pre 3 because it has three inputs. You can connect three microphones into it. Uh, each one of the, uh, the little dials here, that does adjust the gain for each of the, each of the microphones. Uh, one mic goes over here. In this case, it's the third one. The other two would connect over here on this side that you can't see. Um, this is a really excellent recorder. It has very, very good preamps. It's, it's a lot more sensitive. Well, it's significantly more sensitive than the other ones. Um, the sound quality is just, just superb. Um, it's more expensive, too. It's almost $700, so this is not cheap. Um, it can also provide what's known as phantom power to the microphones. And that means that um, a lot of microphones, especially the ones that I use, use either a AA or a AAA battery to power them. But there are other microphones, especially the higher end microphones, that can be powered right off of a device like this. The, in other words, the electricity, the, the power comes off of the recorder, not off of a AA battery. Um, and it turns out that some of the best microphones are powered that way. And if you want to use those, you need to have a recorder that can provide phantom power, and this one can do that. That's one of the reasons why I bought this. Um, it has a 10-second pre-record buffer, so it's twice as long as the pre-record buffer from the Sony I mentioned a moment ago. Lots and lots of options to configure it. Kind of bewildering, really. Um, fortunately, the, the manual is, is pretty, pretty well written, but it helped that I'd already had basically like 10 years of experience before I got this, so I had a better idea what was going on. Again, I wouldn't start with something this complicated. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, a little bit more detail about the other, come on, sir, let's go someplace else, about the other microphones. And, and I'll hold these up and show them to you in a moment. So the, the little Sony, um, let's see, sorry, the little Olympus is a relatively simple device to use. Um, I mean, you just basically turn it on, you, you, you push the record button, that puts it into standby, you push it again, and then it's recording, you hit stop, and it stops. It's that simple. And it has a little playback feature. Um, it's not especially loud, but it's, it's loud enough that you can check to see if you got something. It can record in stereo, or you can switch it to mono. Um, I would recommend mono as much as possible, unless you really want stereo, because when you have stereo, the file sizes are twice as big. Uh, so they fill up your hard drive faster. And to get the sounds off of it, you just use a USB cable to plug it into a computer. And then you can just drag and drop the files across, the way you might with a camera, for example, if you're getting pictures. Um, it, it has a, a dial to adjust the recording level or gain. Uh, that's really important. You want that set pretty high. Um, it also includes a little volume gauge or amplitude gauge, so you can check to make sure it isn't saturating. If it saturates, you want to turn down the, the, the gain a little bit. Um, if you use one of these and you have a cell phone nearby, it's a good idea to put your cell phone into airplane mode because there were, it can cause uh, interference with the recorder otherwise. Um, the little Sony, let's see, let me go back and basically quickly get out of this and hold up the recorder. So here is the little, little Sony recorder. Uh, power switch is right there. These things that look like Mickey Mouse ears, uh, those are actually the little microphones. Um, they're omnidirectional, so they record all around. And they also, because there are two, they record in stereo. So it's now turned on. And to record with it, you hit record. And you'll see it flashing. That means it's in standby mode. And then if you just hit it again, and now it's illuminated continuously, it's recording. It's recording as I say this, in fact. Um, simple enough. No big deal. Not complicated at all. The, uh, the dial to adjust the, the gain or volume is over here on the side. Um, excuse me, that was the volume to play it back. The one to do the, the gain is over here. There, there are a couple of them. Um, in fact, so I just hit stop. It stopped the recording. And if I hit play, and then you just hit it again. And now it's 
So it's recording. I mean, it's, it's saying what I recorded. It's recording as I say this. Very simple. Um, it's a it's a really a nice little recorder, simple enough to use. If you have an external microphone, you can plug it in right there. Um, it uses one little SD card. It goes in right here. Uh, the batteries, those are right there. Two double A's. I use lithium batteries. Typically last six months. Um, they're really good. So the uh, let's see the next. Oops, the next one uh, we're going to talk about the little Sony, um, little Sony recorder. If I can get this back up. Oh, oh I need to get that going. Okay. Uh, so the Sony recorder. This is a, a this is a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more complicated. Um, and it's also more sensitive. It's um, it's got better preamplifiers that give you better sound quality and better sensitivity than the little sound, than the little Olympus does. Um, again, you use you push one button and it's in standby, and on that one you have to push a different button and it records. It's got that five second buffer, uh, pre-record buffer, which is really really handy. Um, both of these recorders have high and low sensitivity settings. Um, it's easy to bump those. Um, I ruined a bunch of nice recordings in Africa once when I bumped it into low. So after that, I put tape over the recorders. I put both switches in the high setting, then put tape over it so it can't move. Um, both recorders have internal memory, which if you're starting it up from you know not, not being turned on, enables you to, to record more rapidly. Um, but if you want to record lots of different things, um, you can put it in the cards. So you don't need an SD card to record, but it, it gives you greater capacity. Um, both of them go to sleep after a few minutes. And you can connect both of them to external speakers if you want to play it back. Um, or you could just play it back without an external speaker. One thing about the Sony, let's see, okay, one thing about the Sony, and um, which I'll show you here in a moment, so here's a little Sony recorder. So I normally just leave this turned on. It puts itself to sleep after um, some number of minutes, and you can specify how many minutes that is. Um, so just when it's asleep, you just push any one of the buttons, and it wakes up. And yes, that does drain the batteries, but it drains them so slowly that it's worth having the ability to get it turned on really fast in just a couple seconds. So I utilize that a lot. Um, so to get this one recording, push record, and you'll see that uh, the light in the middle there is now blinking. That means it's in standby mode. And that also means that the five second buffer is also activated. And then I hit the but button in the middle, and now you see that the light is illuminated solidly. And so it's recording, again, as I say this. So then if we hit stop, it stops. And if I play it back, oops, sorry, I had the... Uh, the gain cranked up too high. But basically, it's that simple to, uh, to get it to record something. Um, now, it has all kinds of other capabilities. You can toggle a bunch of things. You can, with both of these recorders, try different sound recording formats like WAV files, MP3s, and so on. I recommend um, WAV files for all of them. Um, it's also a good idea uh, with these to turn on the low cut filter that reduces low frequency sounds. Things like road noise, airplanes, um, rumble from, you know, like the ocean and so forth. Um, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And so, yeah, as I mentioned just a moment ago, I normally leave a little Sony turned on because it, it wakes up so darn fast. Um, I've missed a bunch of good recordings by turning off the recorders. And then the sound stopped before the recorder turned back on again. So I just leave it on, and then it's, it sleeps, and then it wakes up. Uh, typically use SD cards with 32 gigabytes. Um, both of them give you an option for sampling at different rates. Um, and what that means is, so when I say 48 kilohertz, it means that it is basically recording a sound 48,000 times a second. You think of it that way. Um, both of them can record even faster than that, twice as fast, in fact. Um, but that means your files are going to be twice as large. So depending on what you want to do, there's some level that's probably best. And I prefer 48 kilohertz because when you sample that fast, it gives you better resolution and time on rapidly changing sounds that the birds are making, like a really rapid trill, for example. Uh, say, for, for example, a Buick's wren. 
um, you can see the detail better if you sample it at really high frequencies. Um, if you go too high, though, the files get kind of unwieldy and big. So it, you, know, you have to decide what you really care about. In addition, um, the, the higher the sampling sp speed, the higher the frequency that you can see in the sonogram. So if you sample at 48 kilohertz, the, the peak frequency that it will actually show in the sonogram is, is half of that, which is 24 kilohertz, which is actually quite a bit above the range of human hearing. Uh, most people can't hear above about 14 kilohertz. In fact, a lot of people can't even hear 10, especially as you get older. Um, if you go to really high sampling rates, like 96 kilohertz, um, that's high enough that it can record a lot of sounds made by bats. Uh, even, they're well above human hearing, but you can clearly see them on the sonograms. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The Olympus recorder defaults to stereo, which doubles the file sizes, so I, I turned that off and did mono. Um, the Sony recorder, unfortunately, you can't turn that off, so it just does stereo, so all my files are twice as large. Um, some, some recorders have a, a capability called a limiter, which will automatically adjust the volume if the, if the volume jumps um, very quickly. And that can be handy if you're recording something really loud, like, say, a concert. But if you're recording birds, um, it's actually not that common that you're that close that you have to worry about that. And I've actually had quite a few recordings get wrecked because I had this turned on bef before I was savvy enough to understand what was going on. Um, so I turned that off. Um, similarly, automatic recording levels, that, there can be you know, automatic adjustments there in, internally set. And I do everything manually. Um, I also recommend that if you get your own recorder, carry batteries, extra batteries, and carry extra cards. Uh, it's really quite frustrating when you're recording something wonderful and your card fills. Um, that's happened to me quite a few times, and suddenly you're scrambling to either swap in a new card or delete old files before what you're trying to record stops vocalizing. So now let's move on a little bit to, uh, to external microphones. So there, there are several different microphones that I use. Now these, these aren't necessarily the best for everybody. Um, I personally prefer Sennheisers. They're, they're expensive, but they're also really good. There are other companies that we'll talk about a little bit later that make very good equipment too that cost less than Sennheisers. Um, so I use basically three different microphones. Um, and which one I use depends on what I'm doing. There's a short shotgun microphone, that's the MKE 400. Long shotgun, that's the ME 67. And then an omnidirectional mic, which is an ME 62 which is what you normally would use in a parabolic dish, which I also have. So here is a picture of, of an ME67. Um, this is one that's used by quite a few bird recorders. It's also used by, uh, by TV crews on, on boom poles who are you know, doing uh, interviews for the news and, and things like that. Um, it's got a, got a hand grip, also known as a shock mount, and then there's a cable coming out the back that connects to the recorder. <coughs> so using a, a shotgun microphone, um, does a number of very important things. Um, first of all, it's, it's more directional, much more directional than just using the recorders without one. Um, if you use a parabolic dish, it's also going to increase your signal-to-noise ratio dramatically. In other words, it's going to make everything a lot louder. You'll be able to hear fainter sounds better. Um, but the real, the real thing is that it just really improves directionality. It filters out and that it significantly damps out a lot of the sounds off to the side or to the back. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, and some of them also improve the sensitivity, like the ME67 um, is actually more sensitive than my recorders by themselves. So I guess some of this I already said, you have lower background noise, they're more directional. Um, they're not especially heavy, they're a little bit bulky, but not terribly heavy. That long shotgun microphone I just showed you weighs only about a pound, and I'll hold that up in a moment so you can see it more closely. Um, and these shotgun microphones are really good for, uh, for hiking because they don't weigh much. Um, you can easily put one in a knapsack. Um, I often will just have it um, attached to a little side bag, a little pouch that I hang over my shoulder. Um, they're less, generally less expensive than parabolic dishes unless you get a really, really high-end one. And if you want to record really low-frequency sounds like owls or <laughs> morning doves, um, grouse, things, things that, are at a, that make sounds at very low pitches, you know, a few hundred hertz and less, they are actually better than using a parabolic dish. Um, a parabolic dish is limited in the lowest frequencies it can record by the size of the dish, um, unless you're really going to amplify something like a great horned owl. 
So you might as well not use a dish. Um, shotgun mic is actually better. Um, so th the microphone I used most extensively for several years was this little one, a, uh, an MKE 400 uh, Sennheiser short shotgun mic, which was actually designed to go on top of a camera hot shoe, as shown here in the bottom illustration. It has a three and a half millimeter connector that will plug right into the uh, recorders I held up. Uh, it's really simple to use and it's got a power switch right there. It has a high and low sensitivity switch right here. Um, it's, you know, actually one of these is a low cut, low cut switch. Um, and um, it's, it's a really, really easy thing to use. And it, it's directional, um, it, so it filters out a lot of sounds off to the sides. It uses one AAA battery that will last you uh, for several months. So let me hold that up and show it to you here. So we'll briefly um, get out of the PowerPoint. So here it is. Um, sorry, that cat wants to go out, but it's a little bit late to do that. Um, pardon the distraction. So here's, here's the, uh, the, the microphone with a little fuzzy windscreen on it. This is what it looks like when you take off the windscreen. So this, this you know, is the mic. It's only like maybe three inches long. Um, but it's still directional, um, and you know it's a very capable, very capable little device. Uh, it, being a Sennheiser, it's kind of pricey. It was about two hundred and fifty bucks, um, but well worth it. Highly portable. I mean, you can easily, easily put this into your uh, your pocket when you travel, and uh, I've taken this all over the world with me. Um, the battery compartment is is uh, is under here, and right now I don't have a battery in it. But anyway, so there it is. Um, a, a nice little, uh, nice little microphone that I've used um, extensively. Oh, and to use this with uh, with one of the the recorders, for example, here's the Sony. You just plug it in like that, and and you're ready to go. And the little windscreen is a really good idea. I highly recommend um, using one of those with all of the microphones. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint and. Oops. Let's see. Let me start that up. So this is a somewhat more complicated figure for that little microphone. This is showing you how its sensitivity varies as a function of frequency. So frequency is shown here on the bottom axis. Sensitivity, in this case, it's one of the decibel units, and there are lots of different ways you can define decibels. Um, basically, the higher this is, the more, the higher the sensitivity is a way to put it. And there are two curves here. There's a solid black curve, and then there's one that's, that's dashed. And so what this is showing you is that between a very low frequency of about 200 hertz, which is lower than my voice, all the way out to about 9,000 hertz, the sensitivity of this microphone, the little Sony, is basically flat. It's the same. At lower frequencies, it really drops off. Now, if you turn on a low-cut filter to reduce the low-frequency noise and things like distant airplanes and the sound of ocean waves and approaching cars and stuff like that, then the low frequency sound cuts off um, at a higher frequency. It starts to drop at about 400 hertz. And I normally turn that on unless I'm recording something like a flammulated owl or a great horned owl, in which case you actually might want that because they vocalize at frequencies down in that realm. So um, also, again, to compare this with the human hearing, human hearing cuts off somewhere around here, around 14 or 15 kilohertz. Uh, that is for young humans. Um, for people who are, say, my age in their 50s, most people can't hear up to 15 kilohertz who are in their 50s anymore. Um, someone like, for example, the young birders, they can probably hear up to frequencies like that. So uh, this, um, this complicated figure, <coughs> excuse me, show, <coughs> shows you how the, um, the sensitivity of the microphone varies with direction that you have it pointed, or azimuth. So zero degrees here on this polar diagram means straight forward. And 90 degrees is off to the left or the right. And what is shown here on the left side are, is the sensitivity um, as a function of the angle off to the side for sounds at low pitches. And low here is defined at less than 1,000 hertz. And over on the right side, where it says high pitch, it shows a series of complicated curves that depict the sensitivity at different frequencies that are at higher, higher pitches, like 2,000 up to 16,000 hertz. And what you see is that it's clearly directional. Um, it's most sensitive straight ahead. 
and then maybe off to approximately 60 degrees. Uh, the sensitivity is lowest to straight in back, um, and that the sensitivity <coughs> excuse me, varies with direction, particularly at the highest frequencies. At very high frequencies, it, it, it varies in a complicated way. But those are high frequencies beyond the realm, realm of, of hearing for most people. So it, uh, for most people, it probably won't matter. Um, so basically, it's generally least sensitive off to the sides and in the back, or slightly behind. Uh, like here at about 120 degrees, that's where it actually reaches a minimum of low frequencies. And at the others, it's in a somewhat similar direction. So that's important to know uh, as you're recording something, that you know, having a directional microphone and knowing how directional it really is. Now, Sennheiser isn't the only company that makes these. Um, uh, Rodip makes, makes them as well. Again, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name of the company, um, so I'll, I'll mangle it, but here it is. It, this is similar in price. It's close to $200. Weighs only a few ounces. Uses, in this case, a 9-volt battery instead of a AA. Uh, can also mount on a hot shoe and a camera. Very portable, only about 3.5 inches long. Really nice little microphone, although I personally haven't used this one. Um, so. The one that I use the most when I'm hiking is actually this uh, long shotgun microphone made by Sennheiser. Uh, they make a bunch of these, different models with different capabilities. This is the ME67 model. Uh, it's about 18 inches long, and it's shown here in this illustration without any windscreen or hand mount, hand grip. The microphone is this part here that goes from there down to here, and then this part from here to here is the power supply. Oops. <clears throat> Sorry, that's where the battery is in the on and off switch. And then there's a cable that goes off from there. Um, I normally use this, uh, as I showed in the previous, uh, as one, of the, one of the previous slides, with the fuzzy screen, windscreen, and the grip. And it's about $800 as, as configured. So it's not cheap, but boy, the sound quality is great. It's just wonderful. And it's portable. The whole thing, you know, weighs a pound, like 1.3 pounds. Um, Power supply in this one, you, just one AA battery, usually lasts for months. This is quite a bit more expensive than that little shorter shotgun microphone, but it's a lot more capable. So let me hold this up and actually show it to you um, as I currently use it. So I need to stand back a little bit so you can see this. So here's the, uh, the model ME67. Uh, so this is the hand grip, this part here. All of this stuff here is to prevent or reduce vibrations between your hand, which inevitably is going to wobble, and introducing noise onto the microphone. This thing is the windscreen. Fuzzy ones are really, really good. They're much better than foam. Foam doesn't work that well. And so here's the cable. And it's really easy to make this work. You just plug it in like this, and it's ready to go. And I use this a lot. I mean, I, this is probably the recording setup that I use the most. Uh, because it's lightweight, it's good for hikes. Um, easy easy to, to carry it around. Now, regarding some of the features on this, so I showed you the hand grip. Uh, in addition, the power supply, so this is the microphone here in my right hand inside the fuzzy screen. This is the power supply. There's the battery. Um, you push this button here. So that's what the power supply by itself looks like. Push that little switch there, and it turns on and off when the red light goes on and off. And it has another little switch here for a high and low pass filter, which I normally have turned on. Um, it turns out that these little units, um, if you decide to get one of these, one, they're expensive. They're like $200. And I go through about one of these a year. They, um, I, I, I really use this equipment a lot, and the connections get loose, and it's a real pain. <laughs> so then you have to plug in the cable. Now, to use this with my little recorders, I had to get an adapter, a little adapter cable with a 3.5 millimeter, oops, excuse me, 3.5 millimeter connector on that end, and then an XLR cable connector there, because this, this comes with an XLR uh, cable. It's one that has three pins, basically. And so you do that, and then you put this back together again. And there it is. It's that simple. And so th this whole thing, this whole rig, 
um, I can disassemble it. It easily fits in a knapsack when I'm hiking or when I'm, or even better, when I'm traveling, I, I take it apart like that. <clears throat> so, so there it is. It's a, it's a really nice piece of equipment. It's highly, highly directional, lightweight. Um, and I stumbled into it when I started off pretty much out of pure luck. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just got lucky and bought a really good piece of equipment for my first mic. Um, so let's see. See if we can share this. We'll get back into PowerPoint. Okay. So again, that's what it looks like. Uh, really recommend the hand grip. You'll get handling noise if you don't use one of those. If you just try to hold it without this plastic grip, in other words, you're going to hear all kinds of introduced noise because your hands just aren't stable. And a fuzzy screen, um, although expensive, is much better than foam. I really recommend it. So let's see, we already played around with it. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, again, this shows that it's very directional. That's the plot in the lower left. The directionality varies with frequency, with pitch. At really high pitches, it's more directional over here on the, the right side than at low pitches, but it's directional at all of them. Um, as I say, much more directional at high pitches than it is at, at low ones. So if you want to record something that's really high pitched, like say a brown creeper, this is a great microphone, but you have to have it aimed right at the bird. If it's off to the side, it's going to be way down in terms of sensitivity. And this actually shows you over on the right how the sensitivity um, varies with frequency. So frequency is on the bottom axis, sensitivity is on the vertical axis. And this is for two different directions. Straight ahead, it's the top one, and the one on the bottom, the dashed curve, is dramatically, dramatically less sensitive. So this is a very directional microphone. So it really filters out sound off to the side. And at high frequencies, it also filters out sound in the back, which is very handy. Um, a lot of people who record birds use this particular model, which is why I show it. I know I don't have one of these. This is a Sennheiser ME66. Uh, it's a shorter one than the one I just held up in front of you. It costs less, but it's still a few hundred dollars. Um, but, you know, like maybe $300 less than the other one. Um, it's probably the most popular microphone among bird recorders. Um, <clears throat> and so I know a lot of people really like these. Uh, Ted Parker, for example, used to use one of these. Um, in parts of Peru. Very, very, uh, very, very, very um, capable little microphone. Portable, smaller than the other one. Again, it weighs less than a pound. Um, Sennheiser has recently introduced another model, the MK600. Um, I haven't used this, but it's, it's highly recommended. I know Ryan Terrell uses one of these connected to his phone. Um, less expensive than the other mics. Not quite as good, but it's good enough if you're just trying to document things. And, and quite frankly, the sound quality is great anyway. Sennheisers are really good. Weighs only a few ounces, 10 inches long. The power supply, which is the part here on the right, comes attached to it. It, it comes with it. You don't have to buy a separate one. Um, it doesn't come with a fuzzy uh, a screen or a hand grip, so you need to get one of those, which is going to increase the cost. But it's well worth it. Um, so let's move on to parabolas. If you really want to record sounds that are faint, or you want to record things that are distant, or if you just want to get really good recordings with, with high volume, a parabola is a really good way to go. Um, the most common parabolas used to record birds are 22 inches in diameter, which is about 6 tenths of a meter. Um, there's an omnidirectional microphone in here, inside this, uh, this, this fuzzy screen. Um, <coughs> In this case, it does have a foam screen over the microphone to reduce noise from the wind. Um, then there's a hand grip down here, and the, the cable comes out the back, and then it, it goes down through the hand grip and connects to the recorder. Um, this whole thing, even though it looks kind of bulky, it weighs only about two pounds. Um, and I tested that. I actually weighed one this week to make sure that was right. Um, some of them, especially if, the, if it's a fairly thin dish, you can roll it up, and then that makes it easier to travel with it. You can you know, stick it in a special case, or what I do is I roll it up and then I stick it in the sleeve of a coat and then stick that in my suitcase. Um, or you can even just carry it right on the plane. Uh, it's a little awkward and people will really wonder what you're doing, but, but you could do that. Um, so parabolas are extremely sensitive. They, they kind of act like a telescope. Um, with many, many uh, tel astronomical telescopes, the principal thing they do is gather light. And with a parabola, it's basically like a telescope, but it gathers sound. And the bigger the parabola, the more sound that it captures. And it focuses it on the microphone 
at the focus point on the dish. Um, so it is a parabola. So for those of you who remember from high, high school geometry, you know, the, it, it, one of, among the conic sections you probably study, there's a focus point, and that's where you put the microphone. Um, and you need to get it positioned correctly to take full advantage of what the, the parabola gives you. It's dramatically more sensitive than a, per, than a shotgun microphone, but it's also bulky, a little more awkward to carry it. So, so why use one? Greater sensitivity, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, especially at higher frequencies, um, much more sensitive than your ear, than your human ear, D dramatically more directional than a shotgun mic at most frequencies. You can get much better recordings and you can get them at greater distances from the bird. Um, and it, it's also good to use headphones so you can tell what you're getting. That's true with a, a shotgun mic, but it's even more so with a parabola. And part of the reason why is because it will also pick up distant sounds that you might not notice, like distant cars or barking dogs. Um, now, some things that are you need to be aware of relative to a shotgun mic that are <coughs> sorry that um, that can be you know be an issue is it is more cumbersome. So if you're on a hike, it's a little more awkward. It's not heavy. It's just kind of bulky to carry it around and during travel. Um, it's easy to bump the, set, the side of the dish. You know, hit a branch or it maybe bump it with your hand or with a cable or something like that. And the microphone will pick all that up um, easily. So you have, you have handling noise that's, that's uh, more of an issue. Um, it picks up distant sounds, so you have to be aware of those. You might not notice them. That's part of why it can be good to wear headphones so you can hear those as you record. It's, it's more expensive than a shotgun mic in general. Um, and as I mentioned before, for really low frequencies, actually a shotgun microphone is a better option. Um, if you want to record like a great horned owl or a morning dove, uh, a parabola really isn't the kind of microphone set up to use. A shotgun mic is better. So this uh, is another one of these um, sensitivity diagrams showing the sensitivity at different frequencies and in different directions. So it's a little hard to read some of the text here, but it's basically showing that the, the purple and the red are the higher frequencies, like 8, eight to 10 kilohertz. And it's very, very directional at those frequencies. At the blue frequencies, it's still directional. Um, blue here being, uh, well, dark blue is down to 4,000 hertz, and then next blue down is about 1,000. So it basically, it's very directional until you get to really low frequencies. And at really low frequencies of 100 to 200 hertz, it doesn't really matter which direction you point it, because the dish isn't big enough relative to the wavelength of the sound. The wavelength of the sound, in other words, is a lot larger than the dish. So you might as well pull the microphone out of the dish because the dish isn't doing anything for you. Um, and that's why low frequencies is better to use a shotgun mic. So um, the, the setup that I use, and I'll show it to you in a minute, um, there's only one company in the U.S. that sells these, at least this particular brand. And these are Talingas. Uh, they're made in Sweden. They're sold by Stith Recording in Ithaca, New York. And they've been a supplier for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for many years. Um, used extensively by scientists there. The whole uh, configuration weighs only two pounds. It's, it's reasonably portable, but a bit bulky. Um, I use these on hikes if they're relatively short, a couple, three miles or less, typically. Um, I will often just pull it out of the car from along the side of the road and use it that way. You can also mount it on a tripod, which is really handy. A very good way to reduce noise when you, you know, handling noise. And you can put a windscreen on it too. Um, so that's what it looks like, the one that I have. Um, this is uh, where it's mounted on a tripod. Um, so the, the plastic part is the dish. The microphone is inside this fuzzy screen here. This, this setup, um, just the, the, um, the dish, the microphone, the hand grip, the cables, the screen, and not counting the tripod, was about $1,600. So it's not cheap. So if you're interested in one of these, you really ought to make sure you're serious about it because it's a pretty good chunk of change to buy one of these. It's about double the cost of the, the long shotgun microphone, the ME67 that I use. Um, and I also put electrical tape on it um, around the edges to keep it from chipping and also so I could see it better. Since it's clear, um, it's easy to forget that it's there and I bump stuff with it. Um, but I, I prefer one that's clear so you can see what you're pointed at. Um, so let's have a look at this. I'll uh, stop the um, stop the sharing on that, and I'm going to have to back up again because this is pretty big. Um, so here it is. Uh,
so this is the Talinga 22 inch uh, parabola uh, that was in the picture. So again, this is the dish, of course. Um, they come in different thicknesses. This one is thin enough that you can roll it up. I mean, for example, you can do that. You can just uh, just roll the whole thing up and you know stuff it in the suitcase. The microphone is inside here, so it's got a hand grip in back. Uh, the foam on the hand grip kind of wore out, so I wrapped it with duct tape so that it wouldn't disintegrate. Um, this thing here, this thing here is a uh, tripod mount. So basically, you put the tripod right here, and it has two different size holes. Um, the uh, the actual microphone is in here. Let me uh, let me show you that. I'll disconnect it. Okay. So I just disconnected the power cable, and here is the microphone and the power supply. So this is a short microphone, much shorter than the shotgun microphones are. So here it is, just a, about three inches long. And again, here's a power supply. Same power supply that I used on the other on the other uh, microphone, the shotgun mic. When I travel, I typically carry a couple of extra uh, power supplies just because I've had some problems with them um, out in the field. So then you just just uh, just plug it back in, and you're good to go. And so it uses the same kind of connector that I used with the uh, shotgun mic. So to use this with the uh, with the Sony recorder, just plugged in a little three and a half millimeter connector right there. And uh, if I turn everything on, then it's good to go. You can just just aim it at things. Um, now I find that, oops, I find that uh, my hands tend to wiggle a little bit, um, and so I try to use the tripod adapter a lot, especially if it's you know I'm close to a car and it makes it easy to do that. <clears throat> now earlier I also mentioned a sound devices recorder. So I forgot to show you that. Uh, here it is. It's this nifty little thing here. It um, has a power switch over there. It's actually in a rather awkward place. So it's powering up. There, now it's on. It's got one, two, three places to put in microphones. I currently have it configured for this particular port. Um, since this uses a three-pronged connector, an XLR connector, I pulled off the little adapter cable. You plug it in, and it's ready to go. And you just hit record, and now it's recording. But it started recording 10 seconds ago. Um, and so it's, uh, it's going, and it has things showing the levels and so forth right there. Um, now when I use this, I don't, don't normally just hold it up in my hand like this. I have a little holder for it. Which, but I took it out of that so you could see it. And so it goes in this little uh, uh, port of race holder, if I can get it in there, like that. And then you can just uh, sling the whole thing over your, uh, over your shoulder uh, like that, and then you can control things. And you, you plug it in here on the side. So, <coughs> so there's that. And so this is, this is what the the parabola looks like. Um, it's a bit bulky, but it's well worth it. I've gotten many of my best recordings with that piece of equipment. It's been well worth it. I've been very, very glad that I got it. But I'm also glad that I didn't get it when I first started. Um, I waited several years before I bought that to make sure that I was really serious about it and that I had some clue of what I was doing um, before I started using it. So. Anyway, there are other parabolas available. Um, Sennheiser is, uh, not Sennheiser, Tolinga is the leading manufacturer of them. Uh, they're, they're based in Sweden, but there are other companies that make them, although not very many. Um, Wildtronics is another company that does. They're, they're actually here in the U.S. They're less expensive than the Sennheisers, typically a few hundred dollars less. They make a wide variety of models. I personally have not uh, used these very much. I've just, you know, looked at and looked at one of them. Um, with uh, Matt Young from the Cornell Lab is the one on the left. Um, they come in two different sizes, the 22 inch and 11 and a half inch. Um, they aren't cheap, but they're less than the, uh, the one I just showed you. Um, and you can use either their microphones or any that you might already have. Um, they have a wide variety of options for them that can do a, you know, a whole bunch of different things. The one on the right, the 11 and a half inch, 
um, would be less sensitive than the bigger one, but it's going to be a lot more sensitive than the shotgun mic. So I mentioned before that there are other companies that make microphones. It isn't just Sennheiser. They're the ones I know best, but there are a whole bunch of other companies that make them. And this is, this is a partial list of the companies that I'm aware of who make various types of microphones that you could use to record birds. I know Audio Technica is, is quite popular. People, Rhodey is. Um, obviously, Sennheiser is. Um, and, and I'm sure there are many that I don't know about. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more about how to use this kind of equipment, there are demo videos on the uh, website from the Cornell Lab, um, specifically the Macaulay Library part of it. So um, if seeing how this works might be of interest to you, um, I'd recommend that you maybe take a picture of this slide and uh, with a cell phone and um, so that you have a record of it. And of course, we're going to put the PowerPoint up on the website um, after this talk and so that you can just go ahead and peruse things and uh, see this at your, at your own convenience. Uh, there's a lot of other, other information about recording you know, techniques and so forth on that website, and not, not just videos showing how to use microphones. But that's primarily why I wanted to, to, point, this out to <coughs> point this out to you. OK, so um, last week I talked about using a cell phone uh, with, you know, to record birds. Uh, can you actually use these microphones with one? And the answer is yes, you certainly can. Um, there are a couple of adapter devices that you can get. Um, now this is currently the way that I know how to use it. There may be other options that I'm not aware of, but or that I haven't been able to figure out. Um, an iRig Pre is a little device that uh, enables you to connect to a cell phone. Um, it, when I bought mine, it was only forty dollars. I could basically connect the um, the microphone to a cell phone, and uh, it works really well. It just uses one nine volt battery, and so uh, let me uh, let me do a little demonstration of that. And um, uh, so let's see. We're going to use the. Um, <clears throat> so here's the uh, here, here's the the uh, the little uh, iRig adapter with a little thing for a cell phone. You basically plug this in, and then you turn that on. See the little lights are on now. Get it on so it's just just the green light, and then to use it with a microphone, you just plug. You need need an XLR cable, so um, it's a three pronged one. You just plug that in like that, and then turn on your phone. Get your phone set up, and you're ready to go. And it works quite well, uh, especially with some of the modern phone apps that are really capable, like the Voice Record Pro app that we talked about last week. So um, this little $40 gadget lets you basically turn your cell phone into a very capable audio recorder. Uh, so you may not need to buy a dedicated recorder. You could use your phone, although I will say it's not as convenient. It's, it's more awkward, but it certainly works. So uh, let's go back to PowerPoint. And let's see, we're almost done with the talk. Um, the, there are other, other brands of these available, of course. Here's another one by Sarah Monic, uh, $10 less. Um, <clears throat> easy enough to do. We already talked about this. I will say that that, that little short, short shotgun mic I talked about can't do that. It will not connect to a phone. It's just not designed for it, even though it has a, a three and a half millimeter cable. Um, there are these other little gadgets you can get, other little microphones that will plug straight into um, a phone. Um, I personally have not used these. They do improve the directionality somewhat. And here's a little polar diagram down here. Um, having said that, though, the Cornell Lab folks weren't very impressed with these in their review, and they recommend simply walking a little closer to the bird if you can. Um, finally, <coughs> I want to say a little bit about sound loggers. Um, we're just about done here. But um, so something that I've started doing more recently is using these automatic recording units or sound loggers. And you can deploy these things someplace in the field for weeks at a time and just record whatever, whatever is vocalizing within its range. And you can program them to start and stop at certain times, uh, to have certain <clears throat> sensitivities and certain ranges of, of, of frequencies that they record, and for the recordings to be of uh, some duration that you find convenient. 
So the two that I use, uh, one is called an audio moth, which was without the case, just as depicted here on the left, it was about $80. Um, they're straightforward to use, but don't come with a warranty, and they're kind of delicate. So, you know, caveat emptor, you got to be careful with those. Um, <clears throat> but they're pretty darn good. I've been quite happy with one of those, and I'll play a recording in a moment. Um, and the more expensive ones made by Wildlife Acoustics, like this Song Meter Mini, um, they're really capable. They do well in the field, um, several times more sensitive than the audio moth, but also several times more expensive. Um, and this one's more complicated to configure as well. But it's been well worth it. I've deployed both of these to record, uh, like an owl nest in Rubio Canyon, for example. Um, I've been trying to record some uh, uh, some other birds, uh, dawn choruses up around Islip Saddle, recording crossbills, and trying to record some spotted owls, although it so far hasn't worked. Haven't been able to actually find them. So let me show you what these uh, what these actually look like, and then we'll wrap it up. So here is the audio moth in its little uh, weatherproof case. So it has a little thing on the side there. You pop it open, and here it is. So it's basically a circuit board. It's got three AA batteries on the back. Um, there are a couple of switches over here on the side. There's a connector right there for a USB cable. And with these batteries and with a 32 gig uh, SD card, micro SD card, this can go for months. It can go for about two months. The other one that I've taken to using is this one. So this is a song meter mini, the more expensive but also more capable model. Um, and I've been really, really happy with it. It's, it's like five times more sensitive than the audio moth. So I think with that, we've been going for close to an hour now, so I want to wrap it up. Um, and um, let's see, see if we have, uh, if we have any questions. So that's, that, that concludes the talk. And um, if you have any questions, um, I guess please put them in the Q&A session. And uh, maybe Ron or Mark, you could. Uh... Yeah, actually, Lance, I did have a question. I'm sorry, my mantra went out. But um, on the audio moth and the other one, are those like uh, videos? Are they sound sensitive? In other words, do they start recording when, stand, when they hear sound? OK, well, I'm afraid that your audio cut out, and I didn't hear it. Oh. Um, Okay, um, let me try that again. Yes. Yeah, Am I okay now? Yeah, speak fast before it quits. <laughs> okay. Um, are they, are the, is the audio moth and the other one sound sensitive, like motion sensitive for a video recording? Um, the song meter, you, you can turn that feature on, yes. Um, the audio moth, no. You turn it on and it just records. So... It depends on what you want to record. If, if you care about that, then you can turn on sound sensitive, like a motion detector. Um, I just turn them on and let them go. Okay. And we did have a question in the questions and answer. Um, are these recordings, and I presumed he was talking about the Audacity ones, are these recordings normalized for volume? Um, yes. I, I thank you, Mike, for, the, for that question. And the answer is mostly yes. Um, in fact, let me um, let me show you an example of that. Um, I'm going to bring up um, another Audacity window. Um, I meant to do this uh, anyway, but I forgot. So this this is a recording obtained in Rubio Canyon with the little audio moth um, sound logger. Uh, in this case, it was back on May. Let's see, May first at at uh, um, right around sunrise. And so, yes, um, with the recordings that I upload and that I played for you before, they were normalized. And the way you would do that is you would select the whole recording, as I'm doing right here, and then uh, phooey, go up to the effects part, and then you can normalize. And I, normal, I, I, I usually do this to um, a peak amplitude of minus three decibels. That's what the Cornell Lab uh, people recommend for uh, contributions to their collection. And when you do that, um, well, I forgot to show you what it looked like before, but that, that should have increased the volume. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let, let's have a quick listen to some of this. And um, so you can hear what, what this uh, uh, sounds like.
Yeah, so this, this basically was, the, was part of the dawn chorus in Rubio Canyon at um, about 6 in the morning back on May 1st. Um, it was a rave, and there were uh, Buick's Rams, House Rams, uh, Astro, mm -hmm. Catcher, perhaps some other things. And that was recorded with this little audio moth, which at the time was in a little Ziploc bag because I didn't have the plastic case for it yet. And Lance, obviously, the audio moth is omnidirectional yes. when it records. Yes, thank you. I forgot to say that. Yeah, both, um, both of these, the audio moth in my left hand and the song meter in my right, they're omnidirectional. Um, the, um, the song meter could do stereo. This one is equipped with one microphone, but you could put another one on the other end of it if you wanted that for some reason. Mm. And apparently you can also configure the song meters um, with other kinds of microphones if you want. You could disconnect this one inside and connect a directional microphone to it as well um, if that was something that would be useful to you. And can you just briefly talk about... Um the gain in your recorder and how not to clip recordings so that they sound good for working yeah. with Audacity? Yeah, so, so here, here's this, the little Sony, a couple of things behind that. Here's the little Sony recorder. The, um, the gain on it, on this device, is a little dial here on this side of it, and it's got a bunch of numbers. The higher the number, the higher the gain or the higher the sensitivity. Um, so right now, so I have, it, I have it turned on, and if you look really closely, you'll see that as I speak, there are some green and red lights that are flashing that are illuminating, and you should also be seeing a little bar thing that is going up and down as I speak. The light is going red when it saturates, and that's because the gain is too high given that it's really close to where I'm, like, you know, where I'm talking. Now, if I were to dial the gain down from 9 to, say, 3, now you're going to see the green lights flash, and that means that the recording level is really just about at optimal for where you want it to be. So if you wanted to still amplify this after the fact using software, you could, but it's not saturated. So now, so now what right, happens uh, if what happens if it saturates? What does that mean? Well, it means that some of the information is simply gone. Um, you have you have louder volumes than you're you're able to really record and. You don't actually record the highest volumes; they're just they're just clipped. Okay. Um, so in the example I showed with uh, using Audacity a moment ago, um, normalizing it to minus three decibels. What that means is that it's making the peak volume at a certain level, and in most of my recordings, that means that it amplifies it, makes it louder. But sometimes it'll actually reduce the volume a little bit. And this is something that the folks at the Cornell Lab request to try to have the sound volume as uniform as possible across their collection. Um, you could also you could also just amplify it. I mean, in, in addition to the capability where it says normalize, you could also just select amplify and tell it to amplify either in units of decibels or make it two times louder or three times louder. It won't let you make it infinitely louder. There's a certain you know limit where it saturates, and it won't go beyond that. And also, if you uh, record it, I guess, too low in gain, it's obviously not getting all that sound information. Um, yes. If, if, um, if the gain is really low, your signal is going to be weak. The volume will be low. You can amplify it, but you will also make the noise louder. And so, you know, you'll hear that, too. So um, it, it's, it's definitely better practice, if possible, to uh, you know, to try to get the the levels using the gain in a good, basically in a good place near, basically on at least on that device where the little green lights come on. That that's mm -hmm. why they have little green lights is to give you a sense of you know where the optimal sort of sensitivity is. Um, not all of the little devices do that. The uh, little Sony, I mean, the Sony does, but the little Olympus here, it does not have a little green light that comes on. It does have a little bar that goes up and down, but no green light. The um, the sound devices micro, I mean, recorder that I held up, that has the little bars, and that on the bar illustration, it has green and red. So if it's green, it's good. If it's red, it's too high. Um, so, and how long do you, yeah, you're it's, pretty it's definitely smart. Definitely better practice. Not a, it Say it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, what? Say it again. Um, we didn't, I cut you off. Yes, and I didn't know what you had just said because you, the sound dropped. Um, how long would it does did it take? You're a pretty smart guy. How long did it take you to become competent with all the equipment? Years. 
<laughs> and, that, and that's because I didn't put enough effort into like pouring over the manuals to mm-hmm. really understand things. Um, it's, I, I haven't had the patience to really, to, <laughs> to be, to be brutally honest. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've had help along the way. Um, uh, Walter Zaliga, when he was in this area for a year or so, about a decade ago, he, he had more experience and he helped me in some ways. Um, John Feenster suggested the little small Sennheiser microphone because he has used those and that was a really great idea. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've had some fr- very fruitful discussions with Curtis Morantz who has extensive recording experience. Um, um, some emails that I've exchanged with people at the Cornell Lab um, who have made recommendations for certain kinds of settings. Um, so fantastic yeah. fantastic i do not see any other questions or comments in the chat uh mark did you have anything hold on i'm muted uh no i didn't have anything this sounds sounds great um thank you very much lance in that case, thank you very much, Lance. This was a wonderful talk, and there are some comments about how much people enjoyed it. And thank you again. And I just want re oh, I just want to remind everyone that our recording of this webinar will be up on our website at labirders.org. Uh, part one is already up there, and if there's nothing else. Thank you again. I really appreciate it, Lance. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in. All right. Take care. Yep, thank, thank you. Thank you, Lance. Yep. See, see you all later. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.